Hello, my friends. Cliff Kelly here with Scout the Wonder Dog at my right hand. Just uh, chilling out a little bit after he took a car ride with me up to uh, Starbucks to get a coffee. I think I mentioned this before. This He can't wait to go for a car ride. Then he sits in the back like a little old man and doesn't do anything. Won't put his head out the window or anything. I don't know. I'm not sure he's my dog. Uh, no, he is. Um, listen, I made an announcement on the uh, the uh, My Story uh, wall page, whatever that is, that I'm going to break my rule a second time now. I'm probably going to go 90 minutes on this thing, so if you don't have the time right now, chill, come back later when you do, um, or less. This is, I'm not into hype, um, but this is the most important culminative, I'm not even sure that's a word, lesson I've ever taught. It's kind of the summation pretty much of everything that I've been led to in the last three years. Uh, it's copious with documentation. It's, uh, it's content is controversial, uh, but well-documented. Um, I even have a little smidgen of esoterica in there uh, when we get into this a little bit, but I'm going to take a little more time with it. This is huge in the sense of the content, not me, but the content is really important given what <laughs> we're all sensing and Mm, mm, mm. Uh, watching going on out there. So I'm going to go right into prayer. Uh, I won't rush quite as much. A lot of stuff to cover. And uh, let's see what the Lord has. Father, I thank you. And I praise you again and again and again for the privilege of being a teacher. Uh, I say that quickly with some fear and trembling every time I do this. <clears throat> but you showed up this morning because I really needed reassurance on this one and you, uh, not that every word is going to be, you know, gospel, but you made it clear you wanted me to present this and people understand why, by the end of this thing, why I had some, some uh, hesitation and extra prayer was needed. Uh, bless what we are about to hear. And I mean every word when I say, I don't want any of this to be from me. I want it only to be from you and the stuff that comes out from me, we can just make sure everybody forgets it without even uh, trying to. But what is true? What remains? Uh, what is the wheat as separated from the tares? What is gold separated from wood, hay, and stubble? Let it remain solid, steady in the center of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, title of this last uh, installment, uh, Notes on the Rebellion of the American Pastorate, Last Calls to Repair the Breach. As I said last time, I mean last calls because that's, what I'm hearing him say, so I'm not trying to make stuff up uh, for hyperbole. Part three, uh, I just saw a mistake there. The fall of Babylon the Great. This is where much of my, gosh, intense reflection, study, prayer, more study, scripture, scripture, commentaries, this is where I've been led to, well, let's see, uh, 1986, 1996, in the last 35 years or so, but most especially in the last five and most particularly only in the last year or less. Uh, I've been led to even seriously broach this particular topic, which I will call a thesis in just a minute. That uh, will become understanding to it. We've got two uh, detailed scriptures because of the topic. We're talking about Babylon. And so, first of all, we're going to talk about religious. Both of these are from the book of Revelation. Religious Babylon, Revelation 17, 5 and 6. Hear the word of the Lord. And on the woman's forehead, a name was written, a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, parenthetically, false religions and heresies, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, God's people, and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus who were martyred. When I saw her, I wondered in amazement. Heavy sledding today. The second one uh, in the book of Revelation, one chapter uh, forward, Revelation 18, 1 and 2, doesn't refer to religious Babylon, but political Babylon. They're connected at the hip, but they are distinct and separate in terms of their description and their function in the last of the last days. 
Uh, I read from the word of the Lord. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, possessing great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his splendor and radiance. And he shouted with a mighty voice saying, fallen, fallen, certainly to be destroyed is Babylon the great, explanation point. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a dungeon haunted by every unclean spirit and a prison for every unclean and loathsome bird. For all the nations have drunk from the wine of passion of her sexual immorality. You can make that read spiritual immorality as well. And the kings and political leaders of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth and economic power of her sensuous luxury. May God please bless the meaning of the word of the Lord. Quotations, a couple of them and then a snippet of a third. First one is from Leah Lively in a piece written for Crosswalk, October 7, 2020. Babylon of the Old Testament and the New Testament shared a common downfall. <laughs> Idol worship was their main sin. Big, 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 big observation. Babylon idolized itself and did not acknowledge or glorify God in any way. This is no different from today, she writes in 2020. We are constantly consumed with multiple idols that turn our focus away from God, his faithfulness, and plan for our lives. Idol worship leads to immorality when you are so consumed with the worship of other gods instead of the one true God. Kind of a simple statement, but for me now, it thunders like a cannon. Today, now, watching. Second one is from Michael Fortner. Uh... Oh, goodness, goodness, goodness. I'll talk a little bit more about his bio maybe later. Uh, here's what he writes. One of the most difficult, and this is, this is the blockbuster thesis that you already know is coming. I may have mentioned it one teaching months ago. One of the most difficult things I had to do in order to correctly interpret Bible prophecy was to come to the realization that, and I quote, America is Babylon the Great, what he uh, reduces to BTG, Babylon the Great. I did not want to believe it. I resisted because it means that America will be destroyed, he thinks, in a nuclear holocaust. But after years of study, the evidence forced me to that conclusion. Then I realized that most nations of the world will also suffer great destruction to one degree or another based on their sins. So America will also suffer its sinfulness. America does not. We can agree with it at least this. Get a pass. Oh, no. America doesn't get a pass. And then this little snippet, snippet from somebody named Ilya Delio in a piece uh, just published this year, The Hours of the Universe, 2021. And this, in this I found the coda, the, the, the codicil, the, 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 the little cup of real hope that will come at the end of this study today. Because this is big stuff. God is doing new things. God is doing new things, beloved, Jesus proclaimed, but only those with new minds and hearts can see a new world breaking through the cracks of the old. I don't know what she meant by it, but I know what I mean by it, and I think I know what the Lord means by it, because it's straight out of the scriptures in one I'll read later on from Isaiah 43. This is the part that I have not emphasized very much or heard taught ever. God is doing a new thing, so, so universally and apocally new, absolutely a first in all human history, I would say all providential history, that is so vast, so massive, so catastrophic, so big, so all-consuming that it's necessary for this to take place on this side of what we can only describe as staggering destruction in order to provide a pure, clean platform for the new thing that will last forever and forever and forever. First thoughts. Ever since reading David Wilkerson's book, I think it was 1986, oh gosh, a couple of essays, first one in 1982, I think it was titled, uh, da -da 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 -da. Babylon is Falling. This was uh, yeah, written by his ministry, World Challenge, 1980. 
Here's what he said in 1982. And uh, I didn't read this, but I read what's in his subsequent book three years later. This is what I remember being really ticked off when I read it back in the 80s when I was at pretty much a different Cliff Kelly. And I was. He writes, Babylon is all who anywhere, here's the key word, profess to be Christ's little flock, but who are not. Because they deny him by their actions. Spot on, David. Spot on. Babylon, as far as I am concerned, is any church, any ministry, any minister, any Christian. Here, for me, this is the key term. In league with, don't forget that. With the world, I would add to it if I were rewriting it as an editor, in the in league with the world spirit, spirit of Antichrist. God forbids it, beloved. Pastor, he forbids it. Genesis to Revelation, start to finish, and everything in between. You cannot, you cannot make alliance with it. Any alliance. This, I, I keep hitting this because it's the key between life and death as far as I'm concerned. It is made up of certain pastors, evangelists, and multitudes of Christians, all who have been seduced by covetousness and worldly mindedness. mindedness. It is religion that has been polluted in its ungodly methods and a sanctuary corrupted by ungodly alliances again. He's hitting this in 1982. Took me another 30 years to get to it. He had a hold of a, a dragon back then. I don't know how many people listened to David Wilkerson back then. I expect he was thought of as a nut job by people like me. But then just three years later, he comes out with Set the Trumpet to Your Mouth. That's the one I read in 1985. Now, now listen to He's modified his thesis in just three years. Listen to him now. I believe modern Babylon is present-day America. I know. That upsets a whole lot of you. I can hear the little clicks going off. Including its corrupt society and its whorish church system. Pastors. No other nation on earth fits the description in Revelation 18 but America. I'm going to give you 37 criteria, if I have the time, just real quickly, of what the criteria from Scripture are that identify the nation that is a, that is. The, the center of political Babylon. And I believe it's America, and we can even zero in and point to New York uh, by that list, but we'll see. Um, including its corrupt society and its whorish church system. Boy, I agree. I'm sorry, boys and girls. I'm not sorry. I guess I am sorry for, for watching it. I, I go between grief and anger uh, when I see, and listen, it happened again yesterday. I listened to some more sermons Online, I just, it's just so insipid, beloved. It has nothing to do with what's happening in the world and in America. Nothing. They're either ignorant of it or terrified of it. They won't touch it. No other nation on earth fits a description but America, the world's biggest fornicator with the merchants of all the nations. You businessmen out there, you tell me that America wouldn't deal with the devil himself if a prophet can be termed. You tell me that. Ancient Babylon was long destroyed when John received this vision, which by which he meant, this is future. This is, we're talking future, not the old destruction of Babylon. All right. A thesis then. I'm presenting this, although I believe it 98%. I'm presenting it as a thesis because maybe 97% because I can always be wrong and I've proven that in public before you more than once. But on this, I'm pretty rigid. I've been known to be rigid when I'm convinced that it's true. But a thesis, a proposition or theory that is put forward as a premise to be maintained or proved. I'm offering this to you not as I, I'm, I'm God's apostle and everything I say is gospel. No. But I'm a scholar and I'm careful about these things and I document them because I want you to seriously, even gravely consider them, especially you pastors. This is this could be just for you. I could be in a room with 100 pastors, no congr congregants, no, none of your parishioners, no, just us, me and you. 
And if I could have 100 people listen to this and agree with only some of it, I believe a massive impact could be felt in the American church. Not because I say it, but because God said it. I'm, nothing I say is worth anything, except God be behind it. Yeah, okay, so the two Babylons uh, that I introduced, Revelation 17, religious Babylon, religious, uh, excuse me, Revelation 18, uh, political Babylon. I get the rest of this from uh, the editors at Bible.org, good, good, reliable uh, theological platform. And uh, they, in turn, base an, an exhaustive piece on the work of J. Hampton Keithley III, theologian, Bible scholar, prolific author, pastor, respected, uh, a respected figure uh, who passed away, I don't know the year, in his book, Studies in Revelation, Christ's Victory Over the Forces of Darkness, I think it was published in 2013, before he died. Introduction, let me read snippets. While reasons will be given later to support this, two different aspects of Babylon are contemplated in these chapters in the book of Revelation. Two separate aspects of Babylon and her fall. Chapter 7, I don't have to read all this, I already did. Chapter 17 is religious, spiritual, mystery Babylon, although mystery can also be applied to the whole thing. Chapter 18, the political and commercial system that I'm convinced more and more and more can only be the United States of America in the year 2021. No, no one, even in our despair, even in our breaking apart, can anybody compare to what America still has in place. Uh, so we have two Babylons, religious and political. Da, 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 da. I've said that. And also, he, they go on, these editors go on carefully now. I'm going to insult some Catholics here. My son's a Catholic, so I'm going to insult my own kid. I'm, that's not the right word. I'm going to imp let me say this. Catholic Protestant. You tell me who's the worst spiritual betrayer on the face of the planet today. We could have us a contest. I'm not sure who would win. So you Protestants and evangelicals posturing up there in your big high chair, shut up. Because you ain't got nothing to brag on. 80% of you. 80%, the way I read the, the polls and the, the best way I can read contemporary history, 80% of you are in the bucket with the enemy. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. This crazy, raging old man, what does he know? Indeed. Two prominent cities are implicated as possibilities for religious Babylon. You usually hear something about Rome, the Vatican, and a case can be made. Uh, and then uh, the second political Babylon, uh, the great political and commercial system, mostly it's immediately America and usually New York as the center, the hub of so much world commerce and politics. And again, <clears throat> whether we're talking Catholics in Rome or Protestants in America, yeah, take your pick. I don't pick either one. I've got Christians in both camps. And I hang out with them. Am I an exclusivist? Am I an elitist? In a way, I won't slop with the hogs anymore. By that, I mean Christians who know better, who are slopping with the hogs and worse, and worse, and worse. I can't walk with them. That's the way scripture reads. Except two men be in agreement with one another on core issues. They can't walk together. And I won't walk with you unless you really want to talk about truth, and come to the table with an open hand, not a closed fist. I'll talk to anybody. Babylon's biblical beginnings. Ooh, they were in a good mood making coffee today. Um, let me give you a little short history on, you know me, root systems uh, are, are so vital. <clears throat> Everything that comes later comes from a cause a first cause, a root system. Uh, so let me take this from, where am I getting this from? <laughs> Hold on. Sometimes I don't write the source. It could have been nothing more than a, a Wikipedia review, but I'll, uh, I'll check this and make sure it's in the final copy. Uh, Babylon comes from the Hebrew... Babel, Babel, 
which some say is a Hebrew form of the Assyrian word, uh, blow on past that, the gate of God. It is used in the ancient city on the banks of the Euphrates River. However, in Hebrew, Babel means confusion. That's the thing to remember. If ever we have inherited the foul root system and wind and fruit of the original Babylon, it is in the form of staggering, suffocating confusion in the church, in the church. Just read an article online from Drudge. Uh, probably not going to remember it now every time I try to do it. Uh, about why America was having problems in four or five different different centers. Uh, why, why, have, why have all these things gone wrong with America? Now, I can give you the throwaway line. I don't mean to minimize it. You know, we've forgotten God. Got that. But you know why? And I said it out loud to the article, which I usually do if I'm really cranked up a little bit, to the article and to the author who can't hear me. But I may write to him. I've been known to do that. Because you pastors have not told your people the truth. And therefore, as the article, secular article argued, the American people have become stupid, ignorant, uninformed, and can't tell the difference between what's right and what's wrong, what's productive and what's destined to be a failure. Because you haven't told them the difference between right and wrong regarding Trump, regarding what happened on January 6th, regarding the last four or five years, regarding our history that you used to seem to know about and forgot about it five years ago. You haven't told them. You don't have to worry about me saying that, but there's someone who's going to hold you to account for that. Am I trying to scare you? Mm -hmm. Right into the lap of the fear of the Lord, which you don't have right now, for all intents and purposes. Babel is the first... Reference to Babylon and its beginning, Nimrod, remember that name, recorded as the founder of Babel, later, later called Babylon in Genesis 10 and 11. Uh, Nimrod's nature and character are seen in both his name and in his actions as described, again, in the Genesis account, <clears throat> and the origin of Babylon. His name means, this is interesting, let us revolt or rebel. See, God uses words and names very carefully. Everything's exact. It didn't have this meaning to the Babylonians, but this is the biblical meaning by context and by the form of the word. And some more detail follows. A kingdom is formed as a result of his tyranny, big word, coming back to haunt America right now, right now, today, June 5th, 2021. Though he's not in office, don't write him off, boys and girls. You'd be a fool to do so. God's ideal of a king is a shepherd who leads his people under God and in God's plan. Nimrod, however, our legacy, by the way, is against God, was then, is now in terms of the spirit of Babel, the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of Antichrist is against God, against the house of God, against the true body of Christ. Okay, there's more stuff you can read. My take, I have a number of little DK's take. Somewhat astoundingly, a number of biblical scholars proposed that Nimrod, now here comes the esoterica, oh boy, you know, grab your Coke uh, or your Pepsi or your healthier stuff, coffee and tea. But I researched this from about half a dozen sources and I think carefully there might be something to it. And I'll tell you why. There are some biblical scholars who believe that Nimrod may have been descended from the Nephilim. Now, the Nephilim were wiped out in the deluge, in the flood, in Genesis 11. However, uh, there are those scholars who have done the genealogies and done the archaeology and done the history who argue, it's only a hypothesis, who argue that through Ham, it's very possible that there was still some, I don't know it's DNA, I don't know what language to use, some potential for those I want to call them superhuman in the sense that they were angelic and human. Uh, you can read the, I, I cite the, the account here. They were basically a tribe of evil hybrid giants. And some argue that Nimrod was fierce. Nobody could on the earth could contend with him because he was just such a brutal uh, tyrant and um, uh, warrior on the battlefield. He could not be defeated. Um, from Genesis 6, 4 and 10, 8, 
uh, there were giants, Nephilim on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God lived with the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men. And see, that's the key term that I looked up in terms of the original Hebrew. These were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. And uh, you can look at the rest of it. And then it says, therefore, it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, using the same word. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalna, and the land of Shinar in Babylonia. So, the word for mighty here is for gibor, is uh, in the Hebrew gibor, G-I-B-B-O-R, uh, the plural form of which is giborim. The giborim translates this way in the Hebrew, a powerful one who magnifies himself, behaves proudly, a tyrant who is bold, audacious, a giant. Now, that's the Hebrew rendering. I was stunned when I looked at Matthew Henry's commentary about this passage. Listen to Matthew Henry fairly staid, respectable, straight-laced theologian from the uh, 18th century. Nimrod was a great man in his day. He began to be mighty in the earth. Those before him were content to be upon the same level with their neighbors. And though every man bare rule in his own house, yet no man pretended any further. Nimrod was resolved to lord it over all his neighbors. This is Matthew Henry. This, this is astounding to me. Henry wrote in 1708, the spirit of the giants before the flood who became mighty men, giborim, and men of renown, revived in Nimrod. Now, maybe that's just metaphorical. Maybe that's beloved. I wouldn't present it to you unless I could document it in the scriptures, in the commentaries, and in the word studies. Would never make up something like that. It may not be true. But the point I'm trying to make is America has inherited this legacy, this, this, I don't know what to call it, this ruling spirit of Nimrod. And I believe it rules Donald Trump. I do. I already said that. So sue me. So you can see from this beloved, by conjecture, responsible conjecture, the crucial importance of, or, of origins. I'm just reading some of my right as the first harbinger of what comes later to Babylon and whoever is Babylon inherits it all the whirlwind that's been stewing and steaming and raging for 6,000 some years come to our front door whether Nimrod's rule was human or superhuman we still have the whirlwind at the door at the gates Jesus said Therefore, that the last days will be consumed by an explosion of this, the, the teachers and the, uh, and the carriers of this, these seditious ideas fueled by this seditious spirit dates all the way back to ancient Babylon. Beware of the false prophets, he wrote, he said, teachers who come to you dressed as sheep appearing gentle and innocent, but inwardly are ravenous word, wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Church, don't tell me about policies. Don't tell me about what that man says. I look at the fruit that he bears. And if you don't, you're worse than blind. You may be dead on arrival. Well, I don't know how else to say it. You guys are playing with fire. Scriptures will call it foreign fire. Strange fire. It's not of God. It's not him. It's not from him. It's not his spirit. By their fruit, you will recognize them. That is, by their contrived doctrine and self-focus. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? <laughs> this is, his reasoning was pretty good, don't you think? Even so, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the unhealthy tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Now, here it is. This thing is going to come and hit you right in the face maybe six times before I'm done today. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the you finish it. The fire. What fire? Oh, the one out in my yard today? No. The eternal, unquenchable, unquenchable fires of hell. Nobody talks about it anymore. 
That's the fire that this references. The point. The root of Babylon was fouled and rotten from its beginning in Nimrod, in the Tower of Babel. And I haven't even told that story. So shall its modern fruit be rotten as well in the form of mystery and political Babylon at the end of history as we know it, the subtitle of my book. And the most foul of all the rotted origins, the Antichrist himself emerges out of this twisted, sick, dark milieu. He comes up out of that. And I argue that he's here. And I argue that some of us think, pretty sure we know who he is. Here's a rather tantalized configuration of ancient passages which attest to this that I never realized before. I was looking for um, the fall of Satan, which precedes the fall of Babylon, the, the fall of other nations that will fall uh, in the last days. And I didn't realize... Da, 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 da. Did I not put the... Oh, Dr. Kelly. This is from Isaiah. I think it's 14. From. <laughs> okay, well, let me read it, and then I'll, I'll make the uh, references in the final copy. You shall take up this taunting parable against the king of Babylon and say how the oppressor has still the restless innocence, exclamation point. The golding and exacting city has ceased. This is in ancient times now, thousands and thousands of years ago. How have you fallen from heaven, O light bringer and day star? This is the fall of Lucifer by every theological account I've ever read. And it's all in the same chapter. I'm pretty sure it's Isaiah 14. I'll make sure I put that in there. Son of the morning, how you have been cut down to the ground. <laughs> you who weakened and laid low the nations, O blasphemous, satanic king of Babylon. Man, oh man, oh man. I've never seen that in the same passage from Isaiah 14. The first chunk is about the original king of Babylon. The second chunk, the rise of Lucifer, or the fall of Lucifer, I should say, and then subsequent to that, theologically, doctrinally, the rise of Antichrist in the last day. This is, yeah. this is incredible stuff because I've read all these passages for years. It just seems, it's not me, beloved, it just seems like the Holy Spirit is putting the pieces of some of the puzzle together for us so that, like the sons of Issachar, we can better understand the times and know what to do and act toward them in wisdom. There seems to be a direct line to conclude from Satan to Nimrod's Babylon through today's mystery Babylon the Great, all of which shall end in utter ruin and destruction, as will all those who make alliance with it. If Donald Trump is who I think he is, y'all are in trouble. I mean, not just temporal trouble. I believe you're in, in eternal peril. That's how the book reads. From Genesis to Revelation, I, you know, I think I said it last time, I can't change this for you to make you feel all fluffy and, and sweet. These are not fluffy and sweet passages. They're life and death passages because God doesn't want anybody to die. The scripture from 2 Corinthians 6, 14, and 17 then, for me, leaps off the page in these contexts. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not make mismated alliances with them or come under a different yoke with them inconsistent with your faith. For what partnership have right living and right standing with God with iniquity and lawlessness? Or how can, you, how can light have fellowship with darkness? So come out, come out from among unbelievers like this and separate, sever, sever yourselves from them, says the Lord. And touch not any unclean thing then I will receive you kindly and treat you with favor. Flip that. And if you don't, I won't treat you with kindness and favor. I will treat you with the back of my hand. You've got to understand that part of God in order to fully love, respect, revere, and fear him. And we don't hear that part of God in the churches today. We don't. I've been to so many. Been around since Moses, almost. 
Man, I've seen and heard it all. Work for the big shot ministries, heard all the big shot preachers, you know, all the big names, all the multimillionaires and, you know, flying in on their jets. What do you think God thinks of that? I want to spit, but it wouldn't be proper to do it on camera. I get back to Leah Lively and her crosswalk piece. Cleanly identifies the five idols of Babylon, ancient and present day. One, the idol of self-sufficiency. Revelation 18, 7. Babylon believed that they were the greatest superpower in the world. Sound familiar? They had everything they needed. They did not rely on anyone or anything, but worship their own greatness. Sound familiar? This is from the scriptures, man. That's why it's so terrifying and delicious all at the same time. Second, the idol of comfort, Revelation 18, 14 through 17. Babylon was clothed in luxury and wealth. They had no need for God and his provision. They amassed an abundance, never honoring God or caring for the needs of others. As today. As today. Third, the idol of obsession. Revelation 18, 3. Babylon had the worship of all the nations surrounding it. Hmm. Everyone wanted what Babylon had and could not see the immorality and sin that they were indulging in or they just closed their eyes because it was convenient. Fourth, the idol of church persecution. Revelation 18, 24. Bab the Babylon of the Old Testament and New Testament persecuted the true followers of the Messiah. Not the professors of Christianity. Not the institutional Christians, not the in name only, the establishment Christians numbered in the millions now or tens or hundreds of millions. No, no. Satan leaves those folks alone. He goes after the real, the genuine. And so, beloved, if you're feeling Satan's heat, count yourself honored by that. Finally, the idol of deception. If there were one word to characterize this entire era, age of Antichrist, that's it. You know that. Revelation 18, 23. Babylon deceived all those who worshipped them <clears throat> by allowing them to believe in their greatness when in fact they were full of sin and immorality, just like Donald Trump is filled with sin and immorality pasting portraits and paintings of demons on the ceiling of his penthouse with statues of ancient gods, pagan gods, all over his apartment. And you're worshiping him by endorsing him. And you don't think you're in trouble? What book are you reading? Not the Bible. I was going to say Fox News, but they don't write books. They wouldn't know what to do with it. However, much of this is, I wouldn't say theoretical, but it is responsibly conjectural. I mean, I don't, I can't claim this a thousand percent, but I'm giving you my best shot. So I turn to a skeptic, uh, a Jewish Christian, uh, Natan Lawrence, thoughtful, albeit skeptical Torah observant Jewish Christian from his blog uh, entitled Is America Mystery Battle on the Great? in his blog called Hoshana Rabba. September 25th, 2018. So I'll read his doubts. And if you align with his doubts more than my hypothesis, then fine. We have a couple of candidates that we can definitely consider as leaders of Babylon the Great, if nothing else. As of this writing, no other city in the world can claim more religious influence than the Vatican. And no other city can claim more political and by extension economic influence than New York City, which houses the United Nations. Yet, in conclusion, this is him now sending up a red flag, a warning to all of you and saying, yeah, Dr. Kelly, come on. We urge the reader to be careful, I agree, about getting caught up in the hysteria where prophetic pronouncements are being made by so-called bibli biblical prophecy experts who are whipping the people up through fear. I may be one of those. I hope not. I'm a teacher happens to be zealous. 
Therefore, having hoisted myself upon my own petard, why don't I use that phrase for a long time? To some degree, should I fit in with the good rabbi's criteria? You can go to another site or, you know, read your own stuff. We move to the final statement of biblical evidence to support my thesis that America looks more and more like last day's Babylon. I don't have time to go through all these, but there are 30. I'll just give you samples. 37 reasons for an American Babylon. This is from the Bible scholar R.A. Coombs. I believe he's passed away, published in 1998 uh, from his book entitled America the Babylon, America's Destiny Foretold Bible Prophecy. It's republished, reissued with some uh, edits by Tim McHyde, Escape All These Things, on May 2nd, 2006. So it's on a reissue that I, that I borrow much of this. Much of the article's material has been adapted from Chapter 4, Volume 2 of Coombs' book. <clears throat> These are the character traits. You remember when I did this with the Antichrist, uh, 33 specific characteristics of the Antichrist that had to be met to identify him. Uh, if we're going to identify him, we don't just you know, go mm, and wait for the, the, the face to appear before us. We go to the scriptures. We go to the scriptures study the in-depth passages, commentaries, history surrounding the scriptures. And because everybody's a scholar, if you really want to follow Jesus, you got to be a scholar of the text. Not just listen to old guys like me. 37, uh, maybe read eight or 10, and then we'll steam toward the end. I'm going to go over time a little today, but contrary to ancient, number one, contrary to ancient times, most Christians and Jews today live in America. That's kind of important to the fulfillment of, and the way you read certain prophe prophecies. Two, the, the chief city of Mystery Babylon is a deep water port city. Number of cities agree, uh, could qualify, but yeah, I think of one. That city, is, is, and number three, is the key commercial nation and engine of wealth for the entire world. Fourth, it is the principal commodities, commodities trading center. These are all very similar. It is the leading center of imports and consumption. It is a manufacturing nation. Mystery Babylon, number seven, is the center for merchandising and marketing. It is also known, number eight, as the world's policeman. There's scriptures for every one of these. Jeremiah 50, 23. You can proof text the whole thing. Uh, it is noted for elegant, luxury, luxurious, refined, and rich lifestyles. Isaiah 47, Revelation. It, I can't cite all the scriptures. They're here in the text. It is, number 11, without question, extremely wealthy. Number 13, just skipping around. It exhibits the highest living standards among the nations. Skip over to number 16. It is also noted for drugs and drug use. Isaiah 40. Oh, they've all got scriptures. Uh, 17. I was really upset when I visited Jerusalem years ago. I was channel flipping and all of a sudden, boom, the Playboy channel jumps into the room. Literally. Full frontal nudity. Oh, yeah. I ran down to the manager. I said, what in the blank blank are you guys doing with Playboy channel? In God's city. And he you could tell he was a little chagrined, a little embarrassed. And he said, well, you know, we made a deal with the Americans. And they said if we got what we wanted, then we had to take this. The city is noted for exporting its culture abroad. Revelation 18, 14, and 22. It is also known for being wasteful and extravagant. 18. Let's skip way down here. Number 31. It is where world leaders stream to meet, United Nations. 35, it displays occult aspects, especially within government leadership. Boy, we could plunge into that for weeks. 36, it forges alliances and treaties to allow our military bases to be spread around the world for satanic forces because it makes unclean alliance. Even the founders said, we don't want to do that. Revelation 18.2, 37, finally. Its national symbol is presented in scripture as a robed woman with a cup-like container in one hand considered to be a mother figure of spiritual prostitution. You can figure that one out on your own. Last thoughts. For me, beloved, the game changer for all of this and why I'm so furious now. I will never be the same after January 6th, 2021. I was never the same after 9-11, but this is 9-11 on steroids for me. 
It's political, it's military, it's spiritual, it's demonic. It's in the church. It was sponsored by the church. It was engineered by many of you pastors out there. If you dare to listen to me, you were among the planning committee alongside the QAnons and the, the Proud Boys and God only knows who else. Now, it wasn't Antifa, Antifa, whatever. It was us. It was that silly cartoon, Pogo. We want to know who the enemy was, and it was us. The church is the reason for the downfall of America, who is campaigning hard to be the modern Babylon. It's at the church's door. It's at the Wittenberg door. So, after that Christian insurrection, because that's what it was, you can excuse it all you want, but when you meet Jesus head to head, face to face, try your excuses on him. And in the midst of all of this, beloved, and I monitor, dear Lord, I've got TVs and internet feeds and email sends. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like this guy's just plugged in to all the networks I can possibly be plugged into without going to the ones that are too dark. And I tell you again, the American church remains silent as a lamb. Michael Spencer, respected writer, speaks to this. In closing my discussion for today, writing a piece in the Christian Science Monitor, March 10th, 2009. Boy, you talk about a prophet. No, not a capital P. I don't even know if the guy, I don't know where he is spiritually. But boy, what he wrote. Listen to this from his uh, Christian Science Monitor piece, Respected Journal. Here's how he describes himself. Michael Spencer is a writer and communicator living and working in a Christian community in Kentucky. He describes himself as a, quote, post-evangelical Reformation Christian in search of a Jesus-shaped spirituality. It's adapted from a series on his own blog, The Internet Monk. Here's his lead from 2009. Wow. Like a cannon shot out of the barrel. In 2009, an, and he writes, an anti-Christian chapter in Western history is about to begin. But out of the ruins, a new vitality and integrity will rise. Think remnant. We are on the verge within 10 years, 2019, 2019, of a major collapse of evangelical Christianity. This breakdown will follow the deterioration of, mainline Protestant, of the mainline Protestant world, and it will fundamentally alter the religious and cultural environment of the entire Western Hemisphere. Within He goes on, within two generations, depending on how you define it, it's 20 to 30 years. Within two generations, evangelicalism will be a house deserted of half its occupants. In the Protestant 20th century, Evangelicals flourished, but they will soon be living in a very secular and religiously antagonistic 21st century. We always thought it was going to be the left. And no, I'm not a leftist. But while the left was doing its great destruction, quietly over here, just out of the line of sight, the neo-fascist right, the nationalists, were, were forming and coalescing the culmination of which was January 6th, but it was only the first shot fired over the bow. I tell you, unless my understanding of history and theology is completely wrong, it could be. That was the first shot. If it goes away forever, I'll be frankly delighted to come before you and say, ah, I missed all this stuff. Here's his main points very quickly as I close. Politics. He writes, evangelicals have identified their movement with the culture war and with political conservatism. This will be prove a costly mistake. Amen. Second, illiteracy. He writes, we evangelicals have failed to pass on to our young people an orthodox form of the faith. We're getting sugar plums and strawberries in the sanctuaries. You kidding? I can't listen to that slop. I can't. 
I tried again last night. It was just, I, I really uttered, uttered out, what, what, well, I can't tell you exactly what I said, but it wasn't nice. Fourth, mega churches. There are three kinds of evangelical churches today. Consumer driven. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> Dying churches. <laughs> and new churches, which are mega church. And they're killing the faith. Education, despite some very successful developments that's, uh, in the past 25 years, Christian education has not produced any good fruit. I've been in Christian education for 35 years. With very few exceptions, might as well go to a secular school. The only difference is you attach God and a prayer at the beginning or the end of class. I can prove it by the documentation coming out of your ears, beloved. That's my wheelhouse. That's the world I know. Compromise, the confrontation between cultural secularism and the faith at the core of evangelical efforts to do good is rapidly approaching. In other words, in 2009, he said by 2019, we would be at loggerheads. I don't know that he saw that it would be loggerheads inside the sanctuary, but I believe so, because he goes right head to head to the church. It's in the house. It's in the house. Pragmatism. That's the driving force of the American church. Justification. Uh, Kendall Casey Enroe, be sure to go to her site and read this this tremendous essay. Uh, I can't remember if she wrote it or she was uh, citing a guest a guest author, but it was basically justification. The church has justified its just rancid iniquity by all kinds of excuses that won't fly in front of the Messiah at the judgment. It just won't. And then a remnant, the, the hopeful part. Except, expect a fragmented response to the culture war. Everybody's going off like this and like this and joining camps and joining tribes. But at the end, he says, a significant number, however, God bless them, may give up political engagement for a discipleship of much deeper impact. That's where we want to be, beloved. There's so much more I can say. Uh he concludes, will the coming collapse get evangelicals past the pragmatism and shallowness that has brought about the loss of substance and power in the church? Probably not, he writes. Will it shake loose the prosperity gospel from its parasitical place on the evangelical body, body of Christ? Evidence from similar periods is not encouraging. What we need, he concludes, is a new evangelicalism that learns from the past, if people would read and listens more carefully to what God says today about being fully his people in the midst of a powerful and idolatrous culture instead of becoming like the powerful idolatrous, idolatrous culture of the Donald Trumps of the world. More hopefully then as I close... Harkening back to that little snippet by Elia Delio at the beginning. I was reminded of a scripture. I was reminded of this idea. It kept visiting me in this study preparation. It kept visiting me. Just, son, son, tell them that I'm doing something new. I'm not just destroying all the old darkness. I'm building something brand new. And so I read into the record this precious scripture from Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Now consider this in the context that I presented today about Babylon. Do not earnestly remember the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. I put it in caps. Now it springs forth, exclamation by, by the way, God's emphatic, the Holy Spirit's emphatic. I'm doing a new thing. Can't you see it? Now it springs forth. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive and know it? And will you not give heed to it? I will even make a way for you in the wilderness and rivers for you in the desert. I'm doing that, says God, for you who will stay faithful to me. Fear not. I'm doing this for you. Benson speaks to this in his commentary. But although your former deliverance out of Egypt was in itself a most glorious work, which you ought always to remember and consider, yet this other work, your deliverance is out, your deliverance out of Babylon and all the blessings which follow upon you 
and including sending the Messiah, shall be so transcendent of favor that in comparison thereof, all your former deliverances are scarcely worthy of your remembrance. This is so grand, so great, so magnificent, so hopeful, so powerful, so all-encompassing again. The whole universe is involved in this rebuild of a new thing or build of a new thing. God speaks to the final ideas. So what can I say to you in closing? Three things. Three things. It's severe, but filled with hope. It's severe, but it's filled with hope. Two scriptures and then a commentary. Revelation 18, 4 and 5 combined with Hebrews 12, 25. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people so that you will not be a partner in her sins and receive her plagues. For her sins, crimes, transgressions have piled up as high as heaven itself. And God has remembered her wickedness and crimes for judgment. See to it that you do not refuse. See to it, pastors, that you do not refuse to listen to him who is speaking to you now. Not me, him. For if those sons of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to him, who warned them on earth, revealing God's will. How much less will we escape if we turn our backs on him who warns from heaven day after day after day? At some point, there will be no more warnings. Then it will be God's silence. Then you shall perish. That's simple. Binary stuff again. Second, from Psalm 73. 27, 28, for behold, those who are far from you shall perish. Hold on. They shall be, <laughs> in the Hebrew, they shall be exterminated for their sin. Punished, uh, take 30 lashes, you know, purgatory, spend a little time in the slammer. They shall perish. Look up the word. You will destroy all who are false to you. And like spiritual harlots, Depart from you, but it is good for me, now the admonition to come inside the ark, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God and made him my refuge that I may tell of all your good works. If there's one thing I want to do on the circuit ride starting June 10th is I just want to go and tell him about you, Lord. I just want to tell him about you, encourage people about you and warn the pastors. I don't know what anybody is. Derek, come and listen to me. That there's still time. Joseph Benson, Benson's commentary is I really, really, really begin to close. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. That is, they that forsake thee in thy ways, preferring the prosperity of this present evil world to thy love, thy favor, and thy service. They who estrange themselves from an acquaintance with thee. Hmm. Mm. and the conformity to thee who are alienated from thy life <laughs> through the ignorance of thee which is in them and rest short or decline from union and communion communion with thee that say if not in words here it comes if not in words here's what the betrayers of Christ in the pews and in the pulpits are saying depart from us Lord, for we do not desire the knowledge of thy ways. How dare they? And thou wilt certainly and dreadfully destroy all them that go a whoring from thee, who having professed subjection to thee shall afterward, here's the word, revolt from thee, which is called whoredom or adultery, harlotry in scripture. For none, hear, hear Joseph Bitz, for none are more hateful to God than willful and wicked apostates from the principles and practice of the true religion which they once owned. I didn't write the book. To which I can only add, come out of Babylon while you still can. 
or suffer this unspeakable reply from the Holy One of Israel. Jesus said it with a sharpened sword of his word. Matthew 7, 23. Because you have denied him, because you have told him that you don't want him or his truth or his ways or his principles or his morality or his integrity, you don't want that. Here's what he will say to you from pastor to penitent, well, non-penitent, all the way down to the maintenance folks, if they stiff the Lord any further. Here's what he will say to you. Hear it. Just gave this to me this morning. I already thought I had the conclusion. He said, no, you're not done. This is what he's saying to you to, that he told me to tell you. And then I will declare to them, all of them, the apostates, the unrepentant, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, and go into the outer darkness, where there is weeping and sorrow and the gnashing of teeth forever. As ever, the choice belongs entirely to you, beloved, more than to your wayward con congregations. I just call wayward pastors beloved. I retract that. I'll call you brother, but I won't call you beloved. Not while you're in insurrection. I'll call you brother, and that loosely, but I won't bless you yet. I won't curse you, but I won't bless you. I can't. The choice belongs to you. Vastly more than your wayward congregations, which you have shoved in the wrong direction, week after week, month after month, year after year. James 3, 1. The result, I've never preached this, I may be wrong, but it came to me as the Lord spoke to me about Matthew 7 this morning. If you do not repent, you can choose between two things then, Repentance and then one, apostasy and the second death. Apostasy comes with the second death. Or heartfelt contrition and full-throated public repentance leading to a new and eternal life for you and for the ones who will hear you. How could you possibly turn that offer down? Except by pride. Except by pride. Pride goeth before a great fall, beloved, but the great fall has never been so stunningly defined for me, except in these last few months and years. Let it not be the case. My concluding sentence to you pastors, there is no middle ground, brothers. There never has been. Father, I thank you that you don't leave us in mid-flight. You don't leave us in mid-life. You don't leave us in mid-fall. You don't leave us in the middle wherein, wherein there is nothing, nothing, a vacuum. We must choose. We must choose life or death. We must choose. There isn't an in-between. You've told me to tell them that many times. And I ask you in the name of Jesus, no matter how hard this teaching is, I've never felt more strongly that you were breathing right over my shoulder, right down my neck as I formed these final words on paper. Father, in the name of Christ, please, please, please open hearts and minds and spirits. Replace pride with humility, even humiliation for Christ. Humiliation for Christ is honorable. It is one of the highest honors we can ever experience. Please, Lord, bring that spirit and do away with that other spirit that is flooding our land, flooding our nation's political centers, and flooding our very churches and their sanctuaries and the pulpits. In Christ's name, amen. So yeah, I went over time, but not so much as I thought I would. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll be leaving on a 14-day tour if, if this old Hulk can handle the, uh, the, the trip. The circuit ride from June 10th to June 24th. The plan roughly, and I'll, I'll spell out the details best I can. We'll start uh, Thursday, June 10th. Uh, heading on down to Amarillo, then Dallas, Fort Worth, 
then up into Oklahoma, then maybe across Alabama into Tennessee, Georgia, the Carolinas, and then back west toward uh, across Kentucky, Missouri, Nebraska, and then home. That's just very rough. I'll give you the details. But I need prayers for two things. One, my physical constitution. I am 76. I'm in pretty good shape, but I got stuff that tries to visit me every now and then. Colitis, GI stuff being one of them that is probably the worst thing. Uh, for those of you who have stomach stuff, you know, that can just lay you out. So pray for my GI health and all the rest of it. And protection on the road. And I say this very gently, but for those of you who are patrons and send in your donations, nothing extra, just your normal, just stay on pace with your normal contribution, I'll be fine. I've built up a war chest mostly from your, with your help, and uh, I should be okay as long as your normal contributions come in and uh, won't have to ask for anything extra. As I said, I'm going to stay in a lot of Motel 6s across the country. Uh, gas prices are inching down just a little bit. And me and my three-cylinder Mitsubishi named Ralph uh, will be uh, looking forward to heading out on Thursday. Yeah, so God bless you. I love you. Uh, these last teachings are the ones that I'll be bringing on the road along with my testimony. Uh, if I'm hearing the boss right, this is the message that he wants me to carry with him. So all the more reason for going a little overtime. Love you all. God bless you. Hopefully, God willing, see you soon.